May God's word be spoken, may God's word be heard, and may God's word be lived. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Tim and I have been married for 21 years now, and I remember the day that he proposed. We were driving along the 401, heading to his mother's house, and we were late. And he took an unexpected turn off the highway and said that he wanted to go for a walk in the park. He never wants to go for walks in the park. And I hadn't clued in to what was unfolding. So I was a little bit grumpy because he'd been in the car a long time and I just wanted to get to the destination. But he persevered. I actually left him hanging for what was only, I think, one or two seconds, but what must have felt like an eternity to him. I remember thinking that it was rather funny. I could, of course, have said, no way, my mother will kill me. We were really young. Or I could have said, well, that's a good offer. I'll put your name in the hat and I'll let you know when the draw is, right? But of course, I didn't say any of those things. I said yes. Did I know everything about Tim? Of course not. Did I like everything about Tim? Of course not. <laughs> but friends, I knew enough. I knew enough that I wanted to journey through life getting to know him better. All of us gathered here this afternoon are at different stages of our spiritual journey. We all have different questions, hopes, fears. But I don't think any of us here today don't want to get to know God better. We all want to know God more deeply. And in fact, it's how we as humans were made. We each have a deep yearning, even if we don't have the language or the understanding to put around it, to know God and be known by God. St. Augustine famously said this, You've made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. In our Old Testament reading this afternoon from Exodus, Moses doesn't think he knows God enough to journey forward. He's afraid. And his dogged determination to know God and be known by God, to love and be truly loved by God, <coughs> offers a word of hope for us in the complexity and messiness of our lives, in our real lives, lives where Children still cause sleepless nights, right? Lives where cancer diagnosis might be at the end of a telephone, where bills don't always get paid, and where work may not be life-giving. Real life, where being truly known and loved by God can be transformational. Let's remind ourselves of this story from Exodus. After bringing the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, God has initiated a special relationship with them, calling them from all the peoples of the earth to live as a distinct and holy people. Not so that they could be smug and focused on themselves, no, but so they could be a light to the nations of what it looked like to have God at the center of your lives, both personally and also as a community. And God had even promised to literally dwell with the Israelites in a specially built tabernacle that would be a visible sign of the abiding and loving presence of God. I mean, this all sounds wonderful. The problem, of course, is by the time we pick up the story today in Exodus chapter 33, things have gone south. While Moses was on top of Mount Sinai receiving the law from God, the people down below had gotten restless and had asked Moses' brother Aaron to build them a golden calf to worship. <coughs> this deep betrayal of the love and faithfulness of God, well, it angers and it wounds God. 
And so God decides that going forward, as the Israelites keep journeying through the wilderness to the promised land, this is what God says. I will now not go up among you, for I would consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. God's going to send an angel instead, because God will not abandon the people. God will still be true to the covenant made with them at Mount Sinai. But because they have rejected God, God will now not be present with them as originally planned. And this is actually for their own good, says the Lord. The holiness of God cannot abide with sin. You stiff-necked people. And this is where our reading this afternoon picked up the narrative. Moses is not satisfied with this new arrangement, and he decides to speak up to God. Moses has chutzpah. There's no doubt about it. And he's not afraid to hold up to God words that God has said in the past. Eugene Peterson's translation here is arresting. This is Moses speaking. Look, you tell me, lead this people, but you don't let me know who you're going to send with me. You tell me, I know you well and you're special to me. If I'm so special to you, let me in on your plans. That way I will continue being special to you. And don't forget, this is your people, your responsibility. Moses lists his accomplishments and then makes an extraordinary demand on God. Reveal to me, says Moses, reveal to me your ways, how you can actually be known, so I can understand you and be convinced that you really love me. You can understand Moses' fears. He has to leave this unruly, unfaithful, wild group of people through the desert to some promised land which may not even exist. How will I know, God, that you really love me and that you aren't going to leave me? This is mighty Moses at his most emotionally needy. And God concedes a bit. My presence will go with you. I will give you my presence and my rest, but not my ways. The original Hebrew actually doesn't have the words, I will go with you. It just says, my presence, and I will give you rest. And Moses notices that and comes back a second time to God. No, God, no. I need your presence to go with me. How will I know I'm truly known and loved by you? If you don't go with me as we journey forward, I'm not going. Now what's kind of amazing here is that God doesn't get angry or frustrated with the needy Moses. God concedes again. I will do the very thing that you've asked, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Finally, Moses believes God. But then Moses is almost like a teenager pushing at a curfew, right? And Moses decides to see how far he can push God. And he asks the most astonishing thing of God he could ever ask. Reveal to me now your glory. More than God's plans or God's actions. Moses now asks to look right into the heart of God. But now he's gone too far. It's one of the central paradoxical themes in the book of Exodus, and in fact, scripture as a whole, that the creator of the universe, who flung stars into space and gave us the wonder and beauty of math and Mozart, that the very same God whose glory fills the skies on this beautiful afternoon, would be willing and in fact keen to abide and live with finite, broken, 
grubby, faithless human beings like me and like you. You may know my name, says the Lord, and you may know that I'm free to act graciously to whomever I wish, but my essence, my glory, that will be hidden forever, even from you, my dear friend Moses. I will pass by you and you'll be able to see my back, but not my face. And the fact that Moses' final request is not granted reminds Moses and, of course, us that God is still God and we are not. For all his guts and dogged determination, even Moses cannot fully know God. He can only see God's back, the afterglow, if you will, of the creator of the universe. And yet, it is enough. Moses doesn't know everything about who God is. Moses doesn't even like everything about God. And yet what Moses knows is enough. Even in the face of betrayal, God has renewed God's promise to be with the Israelites on the long journey that lies ahead, and it is enough. Now where does that leave us with our messy lives and our complicated churches? I think there's a word of hope for us in that dogged determination of Moses to know God and be known by God. As we go about our daily lives as parents and grandparents, in places of work, and in those quiet moments before we drift off to sleep at night. You see, we all search for our identity in life from somewhere. It's a basic human need to have a sense of who we are and why we are on this planet. And any identity built apart from God in Christ may seem stable on the surface, but it never is. For example, if you root your identity in life on your career or your working life, then it can crush us when the promotion does not come or retirement hits. If, for example, you root your identity on being a good spouse or a good parent, if that's where you get your sense of who you are from, then when life goes off the rails, which of course it does, we can be devastated. And what we all want, if we really take the time to ask ourselves, is to be both truly known and yet still loved. You can be loved, but not really known. That's nice. It's comforting. But it's fairly superficial. Some of your friendships may be like this. Maybe even your marriage. Work colleagues, you often have that kind of relationship. To be actually known and not loved, the opposite. To be known and not loved, of course, is our great fear. It's why we hide behind masks of anger or arrogance. We try to keep people at a distance so they don't see what is really inside. But what we need, what Moses asked for, he wanted them both. He wanted to be known and he wanted to be loved. It is our heart's great desire and what God alone through Jesus Christ can grant us. Every time as the people of God that we gather together on a Sunday and use the words of confession, we are being open and vulnerable about what we're really like. The pretense drops. We lay bare our fears and failings acknowledging our desperate need for forgiveness and mercy. And only God knows the deepest corners of our hearts, thank goodness. The things done and left undone, said and left unsaid. The pain we cause others, our creation, and have been victims of ourselves. God alone truly knows. Which on one level, can be a little terrifying. And yet, oh yet, in 
the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we have the heart of God just revealed to us. And in it, we see how God delights in us, treasures us, actually rejoices in each and every one of you. This is what we need above all else, to be known, sinful and broken, and yet loved, cherished, and treasured. And in Jesus, we see the fullness of God, not completely in this earthly life, but we see enough of God. We see enough of God in Christ to say, yes, that is who I want to do life with. That is who I want to follow. <clears throat> if, like Moses, both personally and as a church, we root our identity in being known and loved by God, then our neediness, our clinginess, it gets removed. You know that need to always be respected or well thought of? Or the need to have power over other people? And if our identity is rooted in God's love for us, then it's a heck of a lot easier to admit that we're weak and flawed. Because we know that's why Jesus died for us in the first place. And we become fortified for any difficulty that life can and will throw at us. St. Stephen's has wandered in the wilderness for a season, waiting for a new leader to take you forward on your journey. And I know it hasn't been easy. This afternoon, we have joined together to celebrate the new ministry of Theodore Hunt as your priest in charge, to welcome him and Denethia and Doran and Karis into this community and to give thanks to God for God's faithfulness to this parish over many generations and to look forward with hope. And you have a journey ahead of you, one that will have twists and turns, I'm sure there will be difficult decisions to make and probably some healthy fights you'll need to have. Oh, there's some laughter. <laughs> As a community going forward, I urge you to spend time nourishing your knowledge and experience of the character of God in Jesus Christ. Getting to know God better, as Moses yearned to do. And Theodore, it is your privilege to faithfully and winsomely share the gospel of Christ that has been handed down to us from the apostles, often at the cost of martyrdom, to the people entrusted to your care. And you are to do this faithfully through the ministry of word and sacrament. Because as the people of God gathered here at St. Stephen's, draws even closer to Christ, you will be transformed into a people of even greater generosity and abundance. And before you know it, you will have enough money to pay for any ministries you feel God is calling you to. You will! I want to see the budget next year. And before you know it, you will find yourselves willing to make sacrifices of time and tradition to proclaim the good news to the poor, release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to let the oppressed go free. And before you know it, as Dr. Zeus so profoundly put it, like the Grinch, you will find that your hearts have grown three sizes. It's happening already. God knows your failings, and God utterly delights in you and will not leave you. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.